I don't know about you, but it's a real blessing to be able to stop what we do during the week and come here and spend time with you guys. I'm blessed by that every Sabbath. Let's turn in our Bibles first of all. I just want to read Psalm 63, most of it anyway, down to verse 8. Psalm 63, I'm constantly impressed by David's attitude to God. He, is, he was a man who brought forth praise very, very easily. And I guess he had good reason to. Psalm 63, I'm reading from the NIV. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as, as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You know, I love sayings. I'm a bit of a collector of sayings. I was going to drop this on the children, but I thought I'd better save it for the adults <laughs> because they haven't got a clue about these sayings. Every cloud has a what? Silver line. Hear that, kids? All these people know this stuff. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. The best things in life are free. All these sayings have great meaning, don't they? And that's... Uh, just a lovely little way of saying important things. That, you know, bad things happen, but there's a good side to it. Uh, you can tell someone all the information, but you can't force them to believe it. Uh, the best things in life are not money, not things that you have to buy. They're like family, aren't they? Love. Things that you can't buy. What I love was, uh, my friend says it quite often, knee high to a grasshopper. Some of you are knee high to a grasshopper. But one of my favourites is familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, and I found that this saying, familiarity breeds contempt, three little words, kind of sums up a lot of life and how things go. And a lot of us, you know, our, our, even our Christian experience starts to get humdrum, doesn't it? Ho-hum, we say. It's just kind of going along, isn't it? So today's message I'm hoping is for you. If that's your experience, you're finding it's just going along. I'm hoping that what I've got to say today will bless you and encourage you to get to... You know, press on. What is it that makes a man write about God the way David does? So full of love and praise. Do you know God like David does? I'll just run that PowerPoint. Oh, it's already running. What is God like? I wanted to run some of these pictures I've taken from, I just love photographing flowers and other things, but I photographed a lot of flowers in Australia and some of them are from Aussie, you won't recognise them, but I just wanted to run that while I talked. Because to me, flowers kind of speak to me of God's love. Because what's the point otherwise? What is the purpose of flowers? 
I can only think God made them so we'd help, we'd know him, you know, so we'd know how he loves us. God, in 1 John 4, it says God is love. And we think of, you know, we usually end up in couples, don't we? Love between two people is special. And, you know, it's a mutual fulfillment. But, you know, there's only two relationships there, eh? One loves the other, the other loves the one. God says he is made of three. Now, that complicates things, doesn't it? We say two's company, three's a crowd. Three's a crowd. It gets difficult because when you add it up, there's potentially 12 different relationships there. Interesting, I found that fascinating as I study that because 12 is all through God's kingdom too, isn't it? God says he's three and his kingdom is... In fact, the kingdom number is 12. 12 disciples, 12 tribes, 12 gates. Very interesting. But in that sort of situation, it's completely different. Let me read something to you. Love inherently depends upon the presence of others. It cannot be expressed alone. Love, when expressed in the presence of one, can only be directed to the self and would only produce pride or self-love. Therefore, a God of love cannot exist alone. In a sense, God is like a family, a Godhead composed of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And together, the three persons of the Godhead are united in purpose, in power and in perfect love. The relationships between these three are very important, as we shall see. When two beings are considered together, only two relationships exist. But, sorry, I've already said that. With three members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the complexity of relationships increases significantly. A loves B, B loves A. A loves C, C loves A, B loves C, C loves B. A and B together love C, C loves A and B, A and C love B, B loves A and C, B and C love A, and A loves B and C. Two beings require only two relationships, while three beings produce at least 12. Theoretically, two all-powerful and all-knowing beings could disagree and still maintain perfect balance. You think about that? That's, this is the Eastern concept. See that? Good and evil balancing. This is um, how they say life consists. The presence of agreement or disagreement between two perfectly matched beings could not, does not matter in the long run, for one could never outmatch the other. As a result, there would be no net difference between perfect opposition, one being good versus one being bad, and perfect cooperation, two being good, working together. But three, not only are the relationships between all three, three all-powerful beings more complex, but any disagreement among the three persons of the Godhead can now produce imbalance, for any two could conspire to oppress the third. Consequently, any, opp any oppression occurring from such imbalance would break the definition of love, wouldn't it? For the oppression of one's freedom hinders the freedom to love. And yeah, I appreciated your prayer this morning, Dave. Freedom is very important to God. Our freedom. It's what makes his job so difficult. He wants us in his kingdom, but he can't force us. And freedom is the same in a relationship. If the girl you love doesn't love you, dragging her by a chain and tying her up in your house and pointing a gun at her and threatening if she doesn't love you, you're going to shoot her. It's not going to work, is it? Love cannot be forced. So God avoids... Another, hang on. 
In other words, God would not be a God of love if he imposed his will on others or if his own will was involuntary or restricted. God avoids such oppression by voluntary, voluntarily adhering to a moral standard or law that is committed to avoiding imbalance. Love within the Godhead therefore requires the existence of law. The existence of a law would by extension necessitate the proper administration of law, justice. Truly love can only exist within the law. Hence the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. This golden rule, a voluntary limitation of the will to such expressions that one would willingly receive, requires the subjugation of the self, or humility. In other words, love is humble. We learned about this this morning in our lesson. When expressed through the spirit of humility, love can then maximise the freedom of others. I really appreciated that from a friend of mine who thinks a lot about these things. Love does strange things to us, doesn't it, to people. It kind of takes over your life. Do you remember that? <laughs> it puts the object of your love above everything else. You can't stop thinking about the person or the thing. It costs you your money, you lose sleep, you tell your friends or everyone, some not even your friends. What else do you do? We do some crazy things when we're in love. But one of the things love does is create. You know, you, you want to get a unique gift for the person. Sometimes you have to make it. You create events, don't you? You create occasions. And uh, love is like that. Just think about this for a minute. The Bible says many, many times that God loves us. Have you ever thought about God being like that? He can't think about anyone else. It's in his nature, the Bible says, he is love. He can't stop thinking about you. He's lo he loses sleep over you. And all of it comes from his love for you. And one of the strangest things, you know, it does seem strange to us who believe at why the world, why people would not pursue this. John 17.3, you know the text, is a very interesting text. John 17.3, part of Jesus' prayer. Many of you probably know it by heart. What does he say? This is eternal life. What is eternal life? It's living a long time, isn't it? It doesn't say that, does it? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Interesting, isn't it? We think of eternal life as living a long time. But time's actually irrelevant when you know God. Why don't people pursue God more? Well, have you noticed that children will destroy the, the, their very security in this world to, to get their own way? Have you ever had a child say, I hate you? It's interesting, isn't it? And I think adults aren't that different. You ever seen the character, he used to be on TV, I think it was an advertisement. He had love tattooed on his fist. Interesting, you know, warped idea. He really believed that that was the way he loved his family. The force. And we humans will do the same. We'll destroy our only security, friendship with God, to satisfy our selfish desires. And I've been reading a little bit about of uh, Solomon's writings in Ecclesiastes. I've always loved the book. His... Uh, kind of summary of life but let me read it to you from the message uh, I'm in chapter 11 if you haven't got a message Bible it would be difficult to follow me poss possibly I think I'm down at about verse 7 or 8 
I haven't got any verse numbers here. Chapter 11, Ecclesiastes. Oh, how sweet the light of day and how wonderful to live in the sunshine. Even if you live a long time, don't take a single day for granted. Take delight in each light-filled hour, remembering that there will also be many dark days and that most of what comes your way is smoke. You who are young, make the most of your youth. Relish your youthful vigour. Follow the impulses of your heart. If something looks good to you, pursue it. But know also that not just anything goes. You have to answer to God for every last bit of it. Live footloose and fancy free. You won't be young forever. Youth lasts about as long as smoke. Honour and enjoy your creator while you're still young. Before the years take their toll and your vigour wanes, before your vision dims and the world blurs and the winter years keep you close to the fire, in old age your body no longer serves you so well, muscles, muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen, the shades are pulled down on the world, you can't come and go at will, things grind to a halt, the hum of the household fades away, you are awakened now by birdsong, Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white, adorning a fragile and impotent matchstick body. Yes, you're well on the way to eternal rest while your friends make plans for your funeral. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. The body's put back in the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. It's all smoke. Nothing but smoke. Besides being wise himself, he, he calls the writer of this book the quester. The quester also taught others knowledge. He weighed, examined and arranged many proverbs. The quester did his best to find the right words and write the plain truth. The words of the wise prod us to live well. They're like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God, the one shepherd. But regarding anything beyond this, dear friend, go easy. There's no end to the publishing of books, and constant study wears you out, so you're no good for anything else. The last and final word is this. Remember, this is Solomon, who had how many wives? A thousand, I think it was. He had more money than anyone else in the world. He tried everything there was to try, good and bad. And here is Solomon's conclusion, the last and final word. Fear God, do what he tells you. And that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it's good or evil. So, so uh, a life that doesn't include finding out about God's love is a foolish life, isn't it? Because life is short. Okay, John 15, Jesus, just in closing, John 15, Jesus talked about this. Jesus said something very interesting when he was talking about the vine and the branches to his disciples. John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Hebrews 1, 3. I just want to read Hebrews 1, 3 for you. Keep that in mind. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. These are some of Jesus' final words before he was crucified to his disciples. How did the Father love Jesus? Let's think about that for a minute. If you were going to, you know, if your character had been maligned and you were in court... How careful would you be in choosing somebody to stand up for you? 
as a character witness. How careful would you be? Verse 3 of Hebrews 1. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Luke 4.18. This is what Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recover the recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As the Father has loved me, he said, before my notes... Let me read to you. I don't know if you uh, have been reading Steps to Christ lately. God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass, the lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the, del the delicately tinted flowers and their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest, with their rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. This is his glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And he, he is slow to anger and of great kindness because he delighteth in mercy. Is this the God that you know? God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth through the things of nature in the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but perf imperfectly represent his love. Though all these evidences have been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the Creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon them. Is that the God you think of when you think of God? It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. That was his reason to come. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so I have loved you. That's interesting. Can you make the transition? Jesus loves us so much he wants us to represent his character to the world. That's amazing, isn't it? So we better get his character right, hadn't we? <laughs> God manifested his love in the work of creation. When the earth was created, it was holy and beautiful. God pronounced it very good. Every flower, every shrub, every tree answered the purpose of its creator. Everything upon which the eye rested was lovely and filled the mind and the thoughts of the love of God, with thoughts of the love of God. Every sound was music in perfect harmony with the voice of God. The green fields, the lofty trees, the glad sunshine, the clouds, the dew, the solemn silence in the night, the glory of the starry heavens and the moon and its beauty all bear witness to his wonder-working power. Not a drop of rain falls, not a ray of light is shed upon our unthankful world, but it testifies to God's long forbearance and his great love. Through tempting man to sin, Satan hoped to counteract the tide of divine love flowing to the human race. But instead of this, 
His work resulted in calling forth new and deeper manifestations of God's mercy and his goodness. In redemption, God has revealed his love and sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable. You know, we come to church and we talk about it and we study it, but we can't even measure it. Now I've lost my place. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's how much he loved the world. When Adam's sin plunged the race into hopeless misery, God might have cut himself loose from fallen beings. He might have treated them as sinners deserved to be treated. He might have commanded the angels of heaven to pour out upon our world the vials of his wrath. He might have removed this dark blot from the universe, but he did not do this. Instead of banishing them from his presence, he came still nearer to the fallen race. He gave his son to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ, by his human relationship to men, drew them close to God. He clothed his divine nature with the garb of humanity and demonstrated before the heavenly universe, before the unfallen worlds, how much God loves the children of men. The gift of God to man is beyond computation. Nothing was withheld. God would put, not permit it to be said that he could have done more or revealed to humanity a greater measure of love. In the gift of Christ, he gave all heaven. Amazing, isn't it? And you know what Jesus says in verse 12? Love one another as I have loved you. So the Father sent Christ to represent his character. Jesus sends us to represent his character. And he says, love one another. So our community represents his character to the community around us. That's how it works. Make sure I've read all the bits I want to read. I chose uh, one of the songs today, and it's this last one. I really appreciate uh, Grant's songs. Uh, they really fitted the theme nicely. But I chose this one, The Love of God. And we haven't sung it lately, but... Uh, you guys coming up to help us? <laughs> no, okay. And uh, but it's a beautiful hymn, really, that uh, you hear sometimes on three ABN because Danny Shelton loves it. And uh, it was written by a guy called Frederick Lehman, and inspired by a poem. A lot of people thought it was written by a man in an insane asylum, but it was actually he actually had written part of a poem that was written a thousand years ago by a Jewish rabbi. And uh, the last verse is really the one that everyone loves. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole those stretched from sky to sky. I want you to go away from here today thinking about God in a much more positive way. We, we kind of, familiarity breeds content, doesn't it? We start to think God's like us. <laughs> God is not like us. God made us and he loves us. And he wants us in his kingdom more than anything else. So I want to encourage you to uh, think of this song, maybe. And I'll just call the musicians up and we'll try and sing it. The love of God.
Father, we do thank you for your wonderful love. We can only praise you because of it. But uh, help us appreciate the freedom it gives us <coughs> to tell the wonderful story of your love. And uh, may we be a blessing as we leave this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>